Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you that your greatest desire in Jesus has been for us. Not for something from us or through us, but to know and love us. We confess we've often desired things other than you. <clears throat> ask your forgiveness for that. And please teach us more about your glorious ambition today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's a strange thing that the scripture admonishes us to set our hopes uh, not on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. But uh, people often want things rather than the Lord. Now, this issue about prosperity and finance and so on is a hot topic here in Perth at the moment, where the pastor of our largest church recently resigned in the middle of a major financial crisis for the fellowship, which involves millions of dollars. Amazingly, and I've got this link here in my notes, the public letter explaining the situation mentions finance a number of times, but contains no reference to Jesus Christ or his cross. This is a very manifest sign that the real crisis of Western Christianity has got nothing to do with power, influence or money, but a failure to know the gospel as the power of God to salvation. If you went through, for example, Ephesians, we would find that the riches we enjoy in the Lord are wonderful spiritual ones. Grace and inheritance and mercy, kindness, riches in Christ and glory. Why then are we so stupid as to prefer, prefer material over spiritual wealth? Since our earthly lives are finite, why do we not heed what Jesus said in uh, Luke 12, 21? That we should be above all else rich towards God. Now, this teaching hopefully explores this question of desire for material wealth in a new light. Now, let's go back to Eden. Eden means delight. And in Eden, God did provide everything for the enjoyment of his children. The trees, the trees were all pleasant to the sight and good for food. Everything was well presented and tasty in God's garden, but without any trace of the raging food pornography, a lust for food, really, which is part of our culture. Even more impressively, we're told about Eden, in, this is in Genesis 2, 11 and 12, there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and onyx stone are there. The gold God made was attractive and impressive, shining and unblemished with his glory. The precious stones of the garden likewise testified of the beauty of the Lord, testified of something beyond themselves, the beauty of the Lord. But far greater than all these physical delights, Adam and he, Eve had the source of all the wonders of the world, the uncreated word that the Lord had spoken into their hearts. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day that you eat it you shall surely die. So the greatest wonder in the garden was the uncreated word of God. This word conveyed a glorious, and I hear I'm picking up some themes in James chapter 3, this word conveyed a glorious meekness of wisdom. It was peaceable. When God spoke to them, it was gentle. It was full of mercy. It was free, completely free of jealousy and selfish ambition. When God spoke this word to them, all these qualities poured into their hearts. To quote Calvin, in this theater of the glory of God, everything reflected the Lord's goodness. It was wonderful. But some terrible things were to happen. The gospel is what Calvin said, a glorious exchange, a, a wonderful exchange. And in this wonderful exchange, Christ took upon himself 
our misery and poverty and gave to us his eternal riches. You might know 2 Corinthians 8, 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. This wonderful exchange was only necessary because of a prior terrible exchange in the spiritual world. And here I'm uh, focusing in on some material in Ezekiel 28. This chapter describes a being perfect in beauty, and notice the Edenic language, a being perfect in beauty, covered with every precious stone, crafted in gold, an anointed guardian cherub. This glorious creature fell through trade in unrighteousness. The satanic spirit always exchanges walking with God for proud personal gain, a sin which cascaded down to earth where, to pick it up in Romans 1, human beings exchanged the glory of God, the glory of the immortal God, for images, exchanged the truth about God for a lie, exchanged natural relations for unnatural. The glory of being given wonderful gifts from God was not enough for the devil, and likewise proved not enough for sinful people. Something supremely sinister lies behind this terrible exchange. Something which gives it great obstinacy, great power uh, to resist change. Satan comes into the garden, entices Eve into visualising she can have all the delights of Eden plus divine knowledge of good and evil. And Satan is persuasive because he presents himself as a father whose ambition for his children, unlike God's ambition for his children, is unlimited. Satan's offer of immortality takes away the boundary of death set by the Creator Father. The serpent's fatherly, that's really, not really fatherly, the serpent's fatherly motivation in prospering his children without limit proved irresistible to Adam and Eve. Well, they soon found out, however, that in choosing the fatherhood of the devil, they had not exchanged mortality for immortality, but exchanged life in God's presence for death in his absence. And John 8, 44 and Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 picks up these sort of themes. Well, at this point, we are always going to, talk, to turn to Jesus. To quote Hebrews 1, 3. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus not only reflects the glory of God as created things do, but is the source of divine splendor. Well, how does this help us? We need to talk about Jesus as a human being. The glorification of the humanity of the Son of God comes through his refusal to be ambitious for the glories of this world. Remember when he's in the wilderness, Satan promised Jesus if Jesus would worship him, Satan promised Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. But Jesus had no ambition for the kingdoms of this world and their glory. He wanted the glory of his Father's kingdom. Picking up themes in John chapter 8 and 10, since the Son seeks only the glory of the Father, the Father loves the Son in his obedience to death. Unlike Adam and Eve, quite the opposite, Jesus accepts the will of God to set a boundary to human life. Sin means death. Jesus accepts that, even though himself he never sinned. Against all earthly appearances, the command of God for Jesus to die the shameful death on the cross, where he will be convicted by human beings, a human court of guilt, reveals this Father, that is the Father of Jesus, is not ashamed 
to have his son seen as a failure in the eyes of the world. So the father is not ashamed to have Jesus reckoned to be a failure in the eyes of the world. This is very important. Christ's cry of forsakenness from the cross, where he cries, why have you forsaken me, is not a what's in this for me complaint, which is so common. It is crying out for the wise word, full of peace, gentleness and mercy, he knows is true to the character of his heavenly father. But there is here, bearing our sin, no such word of wisdom for Jesus. The cross is a perfect revelation that Jesus had no personal ambition, for, no ambition for himself. And the resurrection witnesses to the realisation of the ambition of his Father to raise humanity into the glory of immortality. The Father's purpose, his ambition for his children from the beginning, was to raise us into immortality. But in his way, in the way of Christ. Why are we ambitious for the things of this world when a new creation, one which is eternal, is offered us in Christ? This is a great deception. Scripture encourages us, and we're in James 1, if any of you, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without rebuke. Without rebuke. But despite appalling teaching across much of the church, few dare question the unbiblical, materialistic teaching of their leaders because they, they fear they will be rebuked. So many Christians today are like the Jews of Jesus' time who remain silent in their inward belief that Jesus was the Christ, who remain silent for fear of being thrown out of the synagogues of the assembly. Now you can find that in John 9, 22 and 12, 42 and 43. So people are frightened. I mean, I've done this all my Christian life, actually. I've raised questions from the Bible with pastors one way or other. And generally, sometimes they've appreciated it, but, but often they haven't appreciated it. But mind you, if you're going to ask, you're going to ask questions or or question someone's teaching, make sure you do it from Scripture. But, but this binding fear that keeps people in congregations silent, behind it, behind all such fears, lurks a primal fear of death. Something from which the true gospel delivers us. The dumbness of the sheep in so many of the churches is a sign that the true gospel has not been preached because people have a fear of man and behind the fear of man is the fear of death. The Western church must realise that in union with Christ we've been commissioned to die. So in Jesus we can be fearless before everything that brings shame and guilt in this world. People are ashamed to be poor. They're ashamed to be ignorant. They're ashamed when they're rejected. They're ashamed when they're sick. But in Christ, we have no need to be ashamed of these things because we're heirs of a new kingdom, of a new creation. And this freedom from shame, guilt and fear is the glory Christ shares with us in our union with God and the summit of the ambition of the true Father for his beloved children to free us from all guilt and shame and fear. The Father is ambitious, but in this way, in the Gospel. So I'm coming to my conclusion. Satan mercilessly accuses humanity of falling short of its potential for glory, because sin is the loss of the glory of God after all. And Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Satan accuses... But the gospel proclaims that in Christ we're free from every source of guilt and shame. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
the prevalence and the influence of prosperity style teaching in the Western Church reveals that masses of beguiled, that is deceived believers, have been manipulated by evil powers into substituting the temporary glories of this world for the glory of God in Christ. Substituting the temporary glories of this world for the glory of God in Christ. Riddled, riddled with false guilt and shame, lest through fear of failing, failing to achieve this world's goods, these deluded children have been robbed of the revelation of the wisdom of God in the way of the cross. Well, here's where we need to appeal to the Lord himself. Since no one knows they lack wisdom from God, unless this is revealed to them by sovereign divine initiative, we stand in total need of grace. You can't work it out for yourself that you lack divine wisdom. God must tell you, God must show you, and he will tell you and show you through Christ. If we ask for mercy, it may be that the Lord will share with us some of his pure seeking of the wisdom of his Father that was in his cry on the cross. And if we so ask, we will grow in the likeness of Christ. Well, how does this insight come? How does this wisdom come? How does this true ambition for the things of God come? Well, there's only one way. Through a stripping off of all the wisdom of earthly securities. The way of Christ, the way of the cross, it's not common sense. Now, I think this teaching is clear. And people can always try and contact me and ask questions if they like. So who's up to this way today, this way of wisdom? Let us pray. Lord, thank you for Jesus. And thank you, Jesus reveals you um, as a father whose ambition for us, for our glory, is so intense that he gave you up to die on a cross for us. Please help us to be taken up. Uh, into your ambitions for our lives, which are glorious, wise, and eternal. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. They are glorious, wise, and eternal.